All right, so I hope you guys are enjoying a bit of double dose of scripture this morning. I think it's good. Obviously, we don't plan out what we're going to preach and coordinate it, so it could be completely two different topics, but maybe there'll be some similarities between um, what uh, Lewis preached and what I'm going to preach, but I think it's going to be a different topic. So uh, Matthew 14, 22 to 33, I'm just reading a shorter passage just for sake of time, just because we've got two sermons this morning. So Matthew 14, so a familiar passage where Jesus kind of saves the disciples in the storm on the ship. And I want to just draw out some valuable life lessons from this very familiar passage. Uh, Matthew 14, and straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him unto the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the even was come, he was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I. Be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink. He cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? And when they were come into the ship, the wind ceased. Then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, Of a truth, thou art the Son of God. So the title of my sermon this morning is Stepping Out in Faith. And obviously I'm taking the uh, story of Peter stepping out of the boat. Um, it's a very familiar story if you've been in churches for a while. The storm and the disciples going through it. Oftentimes the storm represents the toil and turmoil and temptation and trials and persecutions and, and the trouble that you go th through in life. And we can learn a lot of lessons of how Jesus deals with the disciples going through the storm and how he reacts and how they react and, and things like that. So I just want to go through this story and, and, and give you a few things that, that maybe you haven't thought about when you've read this story or maybe you didn't realize when you read this story because this story is mentioned in different parts within the Gospels and you get a little bit of different insight when you look at uh, a, a few of them. So I'm going to mention some of those today. All right, so the first point I want to mention about this story is you are never alone. You are never alone. Uh, Jesus is always with you. Even uh, Lewis uh, uh, sort of alluded to Hebrews 13.5, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Um, but we see here in Matthew 14, the way it starts is in straightway, Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him unto the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the even was come, he was there alone. So Jesus is in the mountain. But the ship was now in the midst of the seas, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. You say, Victor, why, why is your first point, you are never alone, when in this example, Jesus sent the disciples off by themselves and he left them alone and went into the mountain? Well, this is why it's very important that you look at the story from different angles uh, in the Gospels, because look at what you realize in Mark 6, uh, when, when they're on uh, the actual uh, sea. It says here, And straightway he constrained his disciples to get into the ship and to go to the other side before unto Bethsaida, while he sent away the people. So what is he doing? He's telling his disciples to get into the ship, go to the other side. And then all the other people that were listening to him, he sort of says, you know, you, you go and disperse. And when he had sent them away, he departed into a mountain to pray. And when the even was come, the ship was in the midst of the sea, and he alone on the land. And look at this. And he saw them toiling and rowing, for the wind was contrary unto them. So you see, even in this story, when Jesus went away, was he, was, he no, was he not looking out for them? Did he not know what was going on? No, he was away. But you notice here in this story he, that he was watching them toiling in the sea. He was still watching over them. He had not abandoned them. Right? And that's why I'm saying you are never alone, even though you may feel alone. You know, you may feel that I'm in this by myself. 
I, I'm, I'm, Jesus is not with me. I don't know where he is like Job says. I'm looking for, I'm looking back, I'm looking to the side. I don't know, don't know where God is. Just because you don't know he's there, that doesn't, just because you can't feel that he's there, or you don't realize he's there, that doesn't mean he's not there, still watching you. So you are never alone. And even this, in this example, they thought they were alone. Because if you, if you understand the Gospels, prior to this event, where Jesus has gone away into a mountain to pray, prior to this event, there was actually two times where they're struggling on the, on the sea. The other time is when Jesus is actually with them. You know, he's actually with them. He's sleeping on the, on the boat. And then this one happens. So there's slightly two different scenarios, and we'll look at that one in a moment. But you are never alone. Jesus is always with you, and it's a good reminder because sometimes you may feel alone. You may feel abandoned by God, but like we're talking about this morning, being a realist, you need to know the reality of it is you are not alone. Jesus is with you, you know, and he will, says here, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Look at the last verse in Matthew 28. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. And when you're going through the storms of life, you know, whether it's something relational, you know, it could be marriage problems, relationship problems, problems at work, it could be financial problems where you're struggling financially, you don't know, you know, you don't know how you're going to get out of the storm. Um, these are the sort of things people apply to this story. You may feel like you're abandoned by God, but it's always a good reminder that you are not, you are not alone. Jesus says, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Now, my second point is, in this story, is that God gives suffering. So like even Lewis was mentioning, you know, there are certain things in the Christian life, like when you go, you have problems with people in church, you ought not be surprised by it. Same when you go through hardships in life, you ought not to be surprised by it, because that's part of the Christian growth. Yeah, are there, is there suffering that is caused by Satan? Is there suffering that's caused by other people? Is there suffering we bring on ourselves? Yes, there is that suffering too. But don't forget, there is suffering that God wants you to go through as well, because ultimately he allows you to go through all that. And the question is, why does he allow you to go through that? Because he's trying to mold you. He's trying to grow you because suffering causes us to be more like Jesus Christ, helps us to grow in the faith. So I'll, I'll just point you here to Matthew 14. This is the thought I had here in this passage. It says, In the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer. It is I. Be not afraid. So this is where I got this thought where... Sometimes what we fear or what we, we, we the, the, the trial, the struggle or the fear that comes into our life is actually from God himself. And it's like I sort of think here, they, you know, they think, well, we're already going through this storm and now this, this ghost is coming to maybe cause us some harm. They're fearful. They're not sure who it is, but then they realize, oh, it's actually, it's actually Jesus. So we can have that response as well, that sometimes something comes into our life that we think is a spirit that's here to torment us, but it's actually sent by God in order to strengthen us. And here Jesus was come here to help them, but their initial reaction was fear. Philippians 1.27, look what it says here, Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you, you stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. <coughs> and in nothing, terrified by your adversary. So he's saying, don't be scared of those that are come to, to persecute you or to make your life harder, which is to them an evident token or perdition. What does that say? It's, say? it's saying that the fact that these people are here to persecute believers, that's a good sign that they're probably you know, not saved. But to you of salvation. Isn't that interesting that the, the, the evil person persecuting you is a sign that they're not saved, but to you it's a sign that you are saved, right? <laughs> He's saying, but to you of salvation, and that of God. You see, so sometimes we think, ah, oh, you know, God's abandoned me. You know, what's this guy? But then sometimes it's actually God allowing that into your life to, to actually grow you and try you and make you more like Jesus. For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ. So this is not, not all the trials in your life happen by accident, by coincidence. Sometimes it is given you 
It's for something that God has given you to try you, to mold you, to make you a better Christian. So like we're talking about being a realist, understand this, you know, and, 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 and accept this so that you are not just immediately discouraged by trials and temptations in your life. For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake, having the same conflict which he saw in me and now here to be in me. So when you get ridiculed or you get persecuted for your faith, and it can also apply to challenges in life as well. I mean, I think of other challenges besides financial and relational, I mean, health challenges too. You know, people think, oh, you know, why did God do this to me? But you have to always remember, every time you go through a suffering or you go through a trial, you need to think, what is God trying to mold in me? Because that is God's ultimate gain, uh, you know, aim. It's not like God is just in heaven out there just to make your life difficult. I mean, do we forget, like, like Lewis preached this morning, the love of God? I mean, do you forget that God loves you? God cares for you? I mean, God is not a neglectful parent like we are sometimes. You know, God is out for your best interests. So when God allows you to go through something, it's, it's not pointless. It's not in vain. He's trying to mold you, trying to teach you something. So you need to think every time you go through some hard time, what is God trying to teach me? Well, how is God trying to mold me? How is God trying to make me a better person? Because that's God's aim. That's why he allows you to go through these things. So God gives suffering. Number three, and uh, this is one thing I always find inspiring. This sort of inspired the, the, uh, the title of the sermon. Uh, is how Peter responds to what's going on in this passage. My third point is you can create your own opportunities you know, to step out in faith. You can create your own opportunities to step out in faith. Now, why do I say that? When you see here in Matthew 14, and, of, and sometimes when you think about it, I mean, of all the times for Peter to do something great, it's at the time when they're in the middle of a storm. And, do you, and when, when you're going through a storm, do you often think about, I'm about to do something great for God? There's, there's going to be an opportunity open up for me to do something miraculous in my life, generally, we don't think that way, do we? We don't think, man, when things are just going like down the toilet, the last thing you're thinking about is doing something great for God. But like we see here in this passage, sometimes when you are in the very midst of the storm, that's when an opportunity may come up to do something great. You know, you need to have your eyes open. And Peter, you know, he had his eyes open. He wasn't perfect. But look at his response here. It's like when, when they're in the storm, they're seeing this spirit, they, they, they think, oh, maybe it's Jesus. What, 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 is, what is Peter's mentality? Peter's mentality is, look at this, Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee, unto thee on the water. So that always blows my mind, that Peter's reaction to seeing Jesus on the water. Hey, if it's you, then allow me to walk across the water to come to you. Yeah. I mean, what a, what a crazy idea. But isn't it interesting that this was Peter's idea? See, it was not Jesus' idea to say, get out of the boat and walk to me. It was Peter that came up with the idea like, hey, well, if that's Jesus, if that's really him, you know, I could go and walk across the water and join him. So isn't that, isn't that a crazy thought? And that's why I think, you know, you, you, you have somewhat of a power to, to, to design what your ministry is going to be for God, what your life is going to be to God. It's, it's not like God has necessarily predetermined everything, like, you know, like the hyper-Calvinists may believe, and everything's all planned out. You know, you have somewhat of a say in what you're going to do for God. So this is Peter's idea. Peter came up with the idea, hey, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And it was something that was huge as well. Something, I mean, this is not something natural that... You know, obviously he doesn't think he's able to, to walk on water, but here he asks here. So notice here, he says, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And like uh, my point in point three is you can create your own opportunities. And, and it works like that in the Bible. You know, it works where, uh, I'll show you some verses in Proverbs and Psalms. But look at what it says here, Proverbs 16. A man's heart deviseth his way, but the Lord directeth his steps. So like I said, not everything in your life is predetermined. And people want that with Christianity. You know, when, you, when people ask you questions, they, they just want answers. They just want to be told what to do. 
You know, maybe you've had that thought as well. It's like, I don't know what to do. I just wish God would just tell me what to do. And that's not how it works. God gives you principles. He gives you free choice. You can decide how you use the pounds and talents in your life to serve God. But see, you can devise your way, but God gives you guidance. He gives you guidance. He directs your steps. So it's like here with Peter. His, it was his idea to get out, step out of the boat, step out in faith, right? But then God will guide his steps and we'll see Look at that in a moment. I'll just show you Psalm 37, verse 23. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Look at this. Though he fall, isn't that, you know, very, you know, sort of uh, relevant to um, what we're going to see in Peter in a moment. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. So I think this verse is very relevant to this passage in Matthew 14, um, because if we know the way Jesus saved Peter, he held out his hand, right? Matthew 14, this is verse 29. So we see verse 28, Peter saying, Bid me come unto thee, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. Now notice when he stepped out of the boat, Peter didn't just have the idea and then just step out of the boat, right? He said, If it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And then how did Jesus respond? Come. So I don't want you to get this idea that you just, you just have this great big idea for God without taking into consideration what is the will of God. Right? So it's here, Peter was able to walk on water because Jesus, it was in Jesus' will. Right? He said, come. He wanted him to do that. So how do we know God's will? Well, we know God's will from God's word. Right? So a lot of people come up with all this. Maybe they come up with grand, grandiose ideas of things they want to do for God. And maybe sometimes it will contradict the will of God. Right? So it's not just about you wanting to do something for God and coming up with an idea and then just stepping out in faith and then just doing it. But then faith in what? Right? Faith in yourself? Faith in what, how, you, how you think God wants you to do? No, it has to make sure that whatever idea you have, whatever you want to do, lines up with the will of God. And we see here in Matthew 14 as well that even though he stepped out of the boat, he waited for Jesus to say, come. So, and he said, come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. Now just imagine if you were Peter in that scenario. You know, it's like you step out in faith and then you actually realize you're actually walking on water. It's no, 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 no wonder he reacted the way he did when he maybe he, even he didn't believe what he was doing when he was doing it, even though it was uh, according to God's will. Like Jesus had said to him, come. But look at the amazing thing that you could accomplish. And it was his idea when it's in the will of God. So you can create your own opportunities there. And like sometimes if you, like I said, he, he came up with this idea when he was in the midst of a storm. And sometimes if you just wait until all everything in your life is in order, you may miss that opportunity to do something great for God. So that's why you always have to be ready. And sometimes it'll come when you least expect it. So it might be an idea for a ministry or a work. So you want to make sure even what you do for God lines up with God's will. Uh, Proverbs 3, 5 and 6 is a very familiar passage that a lot of people have memorized. Proverbs 3, 5, 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. Look at this. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. That's sort of the thought I want you to think on. Is like whatever you do in life, it's not just what you want to do, what you think God wants you to do. In all thy ways, acknowledge him. You need to be considering, hey, is this something that God wants me to do with my time, with my life? Is this something that is according to his will? And I'm not saying it's very restrictive. It's just that there are some obvious things that are blatantly outside God's will, right? So, in all thy ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. And if we go back to Proverbs 16, 9, you see here it even lines up with that, what we saw before. Man's heart deviseth his way, right? In all thy ways, acknowledge him. But the Lord directeth his steps, and he shall direct thy path. So you see there's this common theme in the Bible that you, if you, you walk the way you devise, you acknowledge God, and then God will start to guide you. And the same here with Peter, his idea to step out in faith, his idea to step out of the boat. It was according to God's will, and then God upheld him to be able to walk across the water. All right, so you can create your own opportunities to do something great for God. Uh, point number four is if you fail. 
right? So I didn't say when you fail because you don't, you know, obviously you, you always, you, you will fail in life um, in, in certain instances, but you don't always fail, right? So, it's, so if you fail in whatever you set out to do for God, then you can know that Jesus is always there, right? Even if you fail, you can see Jesus' response to Peter when even he failed, right? So he had this great idea. He had this great step of faith. He went out. He was succeeding. He was walking along the water. But see, if you, what you have to do is you have to keep your eyes on Jesus. You have to keep your eyes on the goal. What happened here? But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried, Lord, save me. See, when you're out doing something great for God, you need to keep your eyes on Jesus if, if it's his will. Keep your eyes on the prize. You need to not pay too much attention to the naysayers, to the people that, you know, uh, you know you, to your fears, to people that want to discourage you. Right? Because once you start looking around and start, start focusing on the discouragement and the naysayers, that's when you start to sink. This is what happened with Peter. See, rather than keeping his eyes on Jesus and walking over to Jesus, he's looking around and now he's really, he's, now he's thinking, like, what have I done? This is crazy. Like, I'm in the midst of the sea. He starts to forget who gave him that command, who's giving him the power to walk across the water. He saw the wind boisterous. He was afraid and beginning to sink. He cried saying, Lord, save me. And look at this. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, so you see how Jesus wasn't far away. As soon as he cried out, Lord, save me, immediately he stretched forth his hand. Um, you know, that's why it's interesting with, uh, you know, that Psalm 37, you know, Lord upholdeth him with his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? So notice here that when, when we fear, right, like fear is not because Jesus is not with you. See, oftentimes we fear because we think either God is not with us or, or you know, we're, we're worried that or what something somebody will do to us. And fear ultimately, and I think Jesus sort of touches on it here and in others, he touches here in verse 31, why do we get fearful? Well, when we talk about keeping our eyes on Jesus, that's what faith is. Faith is when you're believing on Jesus Christ. You know, you're, you're trusting that what his word says is true. So that's how you keep your eyes on Jesus. It's all about your faith. So when we're fearful, why are we fearful? Is it because Jesus is not there that we're fearful? No, it's, it's, it's our faith, right? It's whose faith we, it, it's us realizing that Jesus is always there. We know Jesus is always there. There's nothing for us to fear. So, it's, it's, it's important that we understand when we are fearful that we can control that, whether we put our fear, faith in Jesus Christ and in his word or not and keep our eyes on him. It's, it's never out of our control because fear is never created because Jesus is not there, because Jesus is always there, right? So if Jesus is always there, why do we fear things? We fear things because we don't believe that Jesus is there. We don't believe Jesus will protect us. We don't believe Jesus will save us if we fail, right? So we are in control of whether or not we fear, have a, have a fear of man or not, you know, a fear of our circumstances. So we see here Jesus saying, why are you fearful? He says here, uh, he was afraid. And he says, oh, thou little faith. When you compare it to some other passages, and this was one I was talking about before, where you have the differing angles of the of the same situation but then you also have the prior situation which was when they were actually fearful and going through the storm and jesus was in the boat so i just wanted to show you those verses here in matthew 8. It says here when he was entered into a ship his disciples followed him and behold there arose a great tempest in the sea in so much that the ship was covered with the waves but he was asleep so remember we're in matthew 14 this is matthew 8. And his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, we perish. So you see how Jesus was asleep in the boat. And look at, look at what he says unto them, even in this scenario. And he saith unto them, Why are ye fearful, O ye of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. Now what is 
interesting about the fact that this passage occurs prior to Matthew 14 when Jesus comes and meets them onto the boat and, G and Peter is walking on them to the water is that prior to that storm Jesus had already calmed a storm. Did you realize that? And even prior, I mean, Jesus is doing all these miracles and yet they are still fearful. And that's a good reminder to us when sometimes when you fear and you think, how am I going to get through this? How is God going to deliver me through this? Or why is God... I mean, have, it's like we forget that these things in the Bible have happened in the past, like the disciples did. They're going through another storm. You know, there's no temptation taking you that is such as is common to man. So it's not like what you go through is any different to what other people have gone through and been delivered through. So it's like here, they're going through a storm and they and they forgot that Jesus appears. The moment Jesus appears, they realize Jesus is there. You would think, ah, well, we're all good. Right? This storm is over. But they're still fearful, right? And same with Peter. He's still fearful when he looks around and he's, he's looking at the winds and, and, and they're boisterous. And they've forgotten that prior, when Jesus was asleep in the boat, they wake him up. He's already calmed the storm once before. And that's why he says here, Why are ye fearful, O ye of little faith? So you see how it's our level of faith in Jesus Christ that causes us to be fearful. And you know, when we're fearful, sometimes we get irrational. Like with this whole coronavirus stuff, right? It's like you can't get, get away from it, can you? It always creeps into every sermon. It's like the coronavirus itself. You just can't get away from it. <laughs> but you know, when people are fearful, look at how irrational they are. You know, yeah, government, just take all my liberties. Government, yeah, just give everyone money. Where does this money come from? It doesn't matter where it comes from. Just government, just, the government has money to give people. You know, wear the mask and the gloves that are completely irrational. And they touch everything. They touch everything. You even have doctors saying, look, you don't, you're not meant to wear masks and gloves just everywhere because obviously it's, it, you're just contaminating everything and touching everything and then you're not meant to be just breathing and reusing the mask and all these, which is what everyone's doing. And that's why the, doc, the Bakersfield doctors were saying, no, we use masks and gloves in a specific situation. You know, when we're doing surgery or something. We're not just wearing it out and about because it actually can be worse for you. But because people are fearful, it's like they no longer think anymore. They're no longer rational. It's the same here. Because look at what, how they respond here in Mark 4. This is the, the same situation as Matthew 8, right, where Jesus is in the boat with them. Another account of the same, same event. So it's here in Mark 4, 37. And there arose a great storm of wind. The waves, the waves beat into the ship so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship asleep on a pillow. Um, I mean, how Jesus was sleeping through this story, you know, I don't know whether he's just sleeping for the sake of this story, but I mean, I don't know who, uh, how you sleep when it's all going and all crazy. So but he's, you know, he just goes to show that, you know, maybe, he, maybe here it's like he's like the perfect example that if, if you're in the will of God and even though the storms are all going right and everyone else is freaking out, the man that is the perfect example is at complete peace. <laughs> complete calm, you know, having, the, having a great nap, you know, here it says he was asleep on a pillow. And they awake him and say unto him, look at this, Master, carest thou not that we perish? Oh, isn't that a silly statement to tell God? To tell God, don't you care about me? That's, that's, isn't that the silliest thing? To, but don't we say that when we're fearful? And we say that when we go through hard times. We say, like, how oh, can God let me go through this? As though God doesn't care two hoots about what happens in your life or what you go through. Of course he cares. But when you're going through hard times, when you're fearful, you're no longer thinking rationally anymore. You're not thinking biblically. Because biblically, that's the silliest thing to say. Carest thou not that we perish? Of course Jesus cares. But, you know, they just think because he's not doing anything about it, that he doesn't care. And just because God allows you to go through something, that doesn't mean he doesn't care. He has a purpose for it, that we perish. And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? So again, he's reiterating, fear is caused by our lack of faith in God, our lack of trust in in God. We forget that God is there. We forget that God cares for us. We forget that he's allowed us to go through these things. We forget that he's given us a way to escape temptations, a way to overcome. 
So there's no point being fearful. Just accept the challenge, accept the lesson, and take, head it, take it, uh, face it head on. So if you fail when you step out in faith, you know, know that Jesus is there. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Don't listen to the naysayers. Know that Jesus is with you. Don't be fearful right? when you step out in faith. And the last point I have here, this is number five uh, in this passage, is don't be surprised when you are delivered through it. <laughs> you know, in the same token, when you, 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 you like, don't have to be fearful about going through when you're stepping out in faith, if you step out in faith and you do something amazing for God or you do something great or you t it doesn't even have to be something. I'm not talking about something public. You know, just maybe a, something, something in your own life where you've overcome and you, you, know, you do something that maybe you didn't expect you, you were able to. So to some people, it may just be going soul winning for the first time. It may be talking to somebody for the first time. It may be, you know, whatever that challenge is that you've overcome where you've stepped down in faith. Don't, don't, don't be surprised that God has, you know, brought you through that. And it's the same here. It's like when, when he calms the storm, why were they surprised? Yeah, I'll just show you here. Uh, I think I might have these the other way around. Matthew 14 says, And when they were come into the ship, the wind ceased. Then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, of, tr of a truth, thou art the Son of God. And in Mark 6, uh, maybe I didn't have them the wrong way around. I actually did want to read Mark 6 first. I just forgot why I put that one first. Mark 6, 51. It says here, And when he went up unto them into the ship, so this is the same situation in Mark 6 with Matthew 14 where he's walking on the water. It says, And the wind ceased. Look at this. And they were so amazed in themselves beyond measure and wondered. Right? So when Jesus got up into the ship, the, the, he, walk, he walked on the water, all that stuff happened. He, get in, he gets into the ship and all the, all the calm ceased, all, all the storm ceased. They were amazed beyond measure. They wondered. But remember, what Jesus calming the storm had already happened prior, right? So they shouldn't be surprised that this man has the power to calm the sea when he already did it prior. And this, on the same token, if God delivers you through a trial or he helps you overcome something or perform something great in your life, you don't necessarily need to be shocked that God has allowed you to do this. Look at this in verse 52. For they considered not the miracle of the loaves, for their heart was hardened. So sometimes when we're shocked, when things great that God helps people to accomplish or that we accomplish in our lives, should we be completely shocked that that is possible? No, it says here, why were they, wonder, why were they amazed? Why were they amazed beyond measure and wondered? Because prior to getting into this ship, what is this referring to? If you know this chapter and you know Matthew 14, it was the feeding of the 5,000. Like that is a miracle in and of itself as well. The, the five loaves and two fishes and feeding 5,000 people. And it says here, they, why were they amazed beyond measure? Why did they wonder? For they considered not the miracle of the loaves. So not only did they not consider that Jesus had done this before, but they didn't even consider that just when they got off the land, they had just been fed by five loaves and two fishes. So what... What is our response when things like this happen? That's why I went to Matthew 14. So should we be shocked that God will deliver us or God will allow us to do great things? No, our, our response should be praise and worship. Right? And that's what we see in Matthew 14. And when they were come into the ship, the wind ceased. Then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, of a truth, thou art the Son of God. So you don't need to be surprised. But what it should drive you to do is praise God, worship God, and just give God the glory to say, I, 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 you know, thank God that he was able to, to do this for me. So in conclusion, a bit of a shorter sermon today, is just a couple of last closing thoughts. No pain, no gain. Right? If you're not willing to try something, then you may never gain something. And it's the same. You know, stepping out in faith is about taking a risk. No risk, no reward. Right, so no pain, no gain, no risk, no reward. So just encourage this sermon. What I wanted to encourage you to do is step out in faith. You know, take risks. 
right? But make sure they align with the Word of God. Because the goal in life, your goal in life is productivity. It's fruitfulness. Your goal in life is not conformity and comfort. Right? Because that's what people try and strive for. You know, I just want to you know, work or do whatever so I can be comfortable. I can take it easy. That's not your goal. Your goal is productivity. And in order to produce, you may have to take risks. You may have to step out in faith. So I hope as we read this story of Peter stepping out in faith, there were some lessons there that you can remember next time you take that risk, hopefully, to step out in faith. Trust the Lord. Do something great. All right, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for uh, your word this morning. Thank you for the reminder of your love from, from uh, Lewis. And also thank you, Lord, for the reminder that you're always there with us. Help us not to be fearful. Help that to give us the courage to step out in faith in whatever area in our life we find ourselves in. Help us, Lord, to not strive for a comfortable life. And Lord, help us as we go through the storms of life to not be so focused on the storms that we miss those opportunities to do great things of faith for you. So we thank you, Lord, for this example where we can learn good things and bad things from Peter. Help us, Lord, to emulate the good and not to emulate the bad. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.